Hey, Fred Minnick here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about the Bottled and Bond Act, why uh, it came about, why it's important, and its uh, historical significance to not only bourbon, but to our country, the United States of America. Uh, I wrote about it significantly in my, uh, my book, uh, Bourbon, the Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Whiskey. And I have continued to study it, uh, you know, since this book uh, was published in 2016. And I'm fascinated with the Bottle and Bond Act because really it is one of our country's very first consumer protection legislation acts. So before our country wanted to make sure uh, that you had, you know, road safety conditions, that you had seat belts, of course, there weren't cars in 1897. Uh, before you even, they made sure they had special protocols on vaccines. They wanted to make sure that you were getting good whiskey. Now, let me back up a little bit. So this was passed in 1897. I'll give you some uh, a few more details about that here in a second. But uh, the practice of selling bourbon or any type of whiskey in the United States was basically the distillery would sell their stocks, their barrels, to uh, rectifiers or wholesalers uh, or merchants and, and even taverns, and they would not uh, bottle them. Uh, there were a handful of distillers that did bottle their own whiskey. Old Forester was one of them, but that was not the ordinary practice of, of, uh, of selling whiskey. So they would sell it by the barrel, and these rectifiers, these wholesalers, these merchants would profit off of that barrel. And so instead of selling that whiskey as it was barreled, they would add things to it to increase the volume. And I'm telling you, these, these were not beautiful uh, recipes they added to it. I mean, there, there are some recipes out there that called for like tobacco spit. Uh, there's rattlesnake heads. Uh, there's uh, prune juices used a lot. I even saw some uh, like kerosene in, in some recipes. So, you know, they would do things to the whiskey that was not conducive for people coming back and wanting to buy more. And sometimes that would fall back on the distilleries and, you know, people would think that they had bad whiskey, but really it was the rectifiers uh, playing around with it. And the practice of the day in medicine was you prescribed whiskey. And so the doctors would be getting uh, whiskey from these rectifiers and the whiskey was not helping to heal patients. Doctors would, doctors would complain that their patients were still sick because the whiskey was not pure. And the druggists were saying the same thing. So there became like this like uh, groundswell of uh, support uh, to come up with an idea that would, that would help distilleries bottle their own whiskey. And the doctors were really supportive of this because that meant that they could get something that was not tainted. Meanwhile, uh, the taxing of whiskey was something that was was really contentious. Uh, they, at every point in American whiskey history, the distillers have tried to find ways to get out of paying taxes or pay uh, taxes um, on at, at a different time. They would, uh, in Kentucky, they would have their whiskey in bonded warehouses, and they would not have to pay their whiskey until it was out of that, out, until it was out of bond. And so there was all of these efforts to increase uh, the amount of years that something would be in bond. And so in the 1890s, the Kentucky Distillers Association, uh, the liquor wholesalers, these were the some of the biggest like lobby groups, some of the biggest like special interest groups in this country. And they were working their senators and their congressmen uh, over what we now know as the Bottled and Bond Act. Now, when, when this started being talked about, the wholesalers, <laughs> as they do today, began uh, trying to block the block what the Distillers Association want to do, to block what the Spirits Trust want to do, what all of these entities were uh, trying to do. And the, um, the wholesalers argued that they could not get whiskey uh, to, 
to age long enough to be four years old. They, you know, they had a method where they would get young whiskey. They would blend it in with a bunch of stuff. And um, Isaac Bernheim was actually the leading voice for the wholesalers. And he had uh, a lot of interest in American whiskey. And of course, Heaven Hill owns the rights to uh, Bernheim today. And Bernheim was really adamantly against the Bottled and Bond Act because he had uh, a belief that Canadian whiskey needed to be sold and uh, enjoyed in the United States. Of course, we all know that belief would come true with the likes of Crown Royal and Canadian Club. A lot of people love Canadian whiskey. There's a lot of great Canadian whiskeys. But in the 1890s, Kentucky bourbon and Canadian whiskey, you know, if they could have dueled it out in the streets, they probably would have. They were more contentious uh, than any other, you know, two whiskey entities that I can think of in history. And Bernheim was very much in the camp of the Canadian distillers who have always been blenders. The brass tacks of it was that it was uh, distilled spirits and bond that was bottled uh, at, at the distillery. And there was this whole factor that they could like cut it down uh, to 100 proof. And one of the one of the things that really does not get talked about in the Bottled and Bond Act, it's in my book, and other historians have talked about it, like Bernie Lubbers and Mike Veach have talked about it before. But one of the things that's really important for the Bottled and Bond Act passing was exports were not allowed unless they were in the original package. And so this was uh, getting it put in a bottle by a distillery, uh, basically opened the door for them to you know export cases versus whole barrels so that changed uh, a lot of the game uh, from an export perspective and for the exports they were allowed to cut it to 80 proof another thing that was of pressing concern was like after these after these things would uh, be passed inside the uh, be passed and be put to, to the president's desk to be signed uh, Grover Cleveland was the president at the time in his second term. And when it was signed, it uh, was March 3rd. And on March 3rd, Grover Cleveland signed it. He ceased being the president on March 4th. So that just kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of like what the distiller, the, the distillers could have, you know, were probably like, you know, sweating it. You know, they're at the like goal line. And like, what if Cleveland doesn't sign this thing, you know? So that was a very much uh, of concern for uh, the Distillers Association. It was very much uh, opposed by the wholesalers, uh, but it still stands today. And essentially, essentially, it means that the whiskey has to be made at one distillery and one distilling season, uh, bottled at 100 proof in a minimum of four years. That that law still stands today. Now, the original law that was passed did not have any information, did not have anything about stamps or anything like that on there. Uh, the amendment that would be passed in, uh, in July would actually have some additional language uh, that would that would detail like what would have to be on there. And so you would have to know what the distillery was. There have been modifications to it over the years. Other spirits are allowed to be bottled in bond. You can have a brandy that's bottled in bond. You can have a rum bottled in bond. And get this, you can even have vodka that's bottled in bond. Uh, and I have never seen a bottled in, vo bottled in bond vodka, but put paraffin wax inside the barrel and uh and age it in there so so american rules do have uh a, a bottled and bond vodka option so uh yeah giddy up on that one but that's uh that's just a little kind of short history behind the bottled and bond act uh it's really important because it was the bottled and bond act kind of represented a time where the distillers all worked together uh to accomplish a common goal they also uh, set precedent for consumer protection legislation, and they started to get the, the government to look at defining more things about whiskey. They would later, the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906 
would uh, 1907 would later uh, would later define uh, you know types of blends and it would take out uh, medicinal whiskey. Uh, the Taft decision, President Taft would later define uh, bourbon and whiskey, but it really did start from at a federal level the, with the Bottled and Bond Act. And that thing is, you know, we have the 1964 Congressional Resolution, but the Bottled and Bond Act was this country's first real big step into protecting its whiskey but uh how things have changed bottle and bond doesn't quite mean what it used to to a lot of people but this when you saw this on the label that was the creme de la creme that is what people sought uh it's making a bit of a comeback and i dare say bernie lubbers from heaven hill is a big part of that uh heaven hill has the majority of the bottle and bond brands out there but as you can see there are bottle and brand bottle and bond brands from from Texas, Tennessee, all over the United States. So it's exciting to see where that's going. But I appreciate you tuning in for this uh, little history lesson. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you want to learn more about bourbon history or the Bottled and Bond Act, check out my book. You can find uh, links in the description. I will also have links to stories I've written about Bottled and Bond in the past. Cheers, everybody. Be safe. <laughs>